Welcome back to our 11 to 12 o'clock session where we are very fortunate to have Ian Levy present. Uh, Ian Levy is a doctoral student and a fellow of the Center for Health Equity and Urban Science Education. And I'm not going to take any more time from what's going to be an absolutely fantastic presentation. But make sure you read his bio and make sure you take our interest survey for the uh, certificate program in Summer Institute. And Ian, you'll see shortly why he is leading our Summer Institute. What's going on, everybody? Let me pull something up. So in the spirit of what Dr. Emden was talking about earlier, and this being more a meeting of minds and souls than your traditional academic conference, I'm going to start things off in a untraditional fashion. Check, check. All wrong with the hundred grand man. Come on, son, don't treat me like a kid. Check the CV, it'll tell you what I did. We could flip this on its head if you just give me the gig, the middies and cents. Just a little bit of the gift. There's a culture that you're missing and we needed a shift. Uh, I hit the conference with a pack of my kids and let them spit and pick apart all of the ignorant bliss. Swinging the mist like Babe Ruth. So when you finally make contact, nobody can change you. Got the mindset, beauty is what made you. And sorting through that struggle is a necessary angel. Don't let them play you. Find the light in yourself, let it shine, it will save you, uh Hey Don't let them play you Don't let them play you We're the only ones who understand how they move Hey Don't let them play you So this is bigger than us Fighting for identities and triggers is up I'm rolling through my city, bumping big in a bus And I'm not asking, I'm demanding for a space to construct I'm breaking the buck, saving comes from hanging it up Got an army full of scholars saying enough is enough And cooking up miraculous stuff And crafting a certificate for people to want We on the brink, so spitting with synonyms makes you think And counteracts that cynicism sitting in your drink to one blink And what in the heck do they want? And why do I even give thoughts to their wants? I'm letting that alter the things that I judge the circle around me is showing me love And all that means nothing when walking in pub I'm looking for truth to discover So is there a roof up above? Hey, can we get through that and shoot for the sun? This proof of my idols, they getting it done Is that enough of a confidence bump? I'm looking for somebody to tell me we gon' set the stage But never take advice when I'm the one who needs to sway But yesterday I got some news that everything's gonna be okay And I'm hoping to answer the questions I haven't carry that onto the grave Find the light, find the light in yourself, let it shine, it will save you, uh, hey, don't let them play you, don't let them play you, we're the only ones who understand how they move, hey, don't let them play you, find the heart in yourself, let it shine, it will save you, uh, hey, don't let them play you, don't let them play you We're the only ones who understand how they move Hey, don't let them play you We're going to hold up for a little bit for that one. The students have something to show you in a little while. So let me just get this all open here. I did write that, yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's how, yeah, yes, I did write it. Slideshow. Slideshow, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Ian Levy. I'm a doctoral candidate here at Columbia Teachers College. Um, that track that I just performed for you is a new song that I wrote called Real, um, and it details my experiences in and around academia and pushing this new paradigm along with um, my mentors and, and the people who surround me and the constant sort of self-doubt that comes with that process because much like what Dr. Emden just told us, when you are pushing something that nobody else wants to hear about, it comes with stress that is inherent to the process, right? And there are going to be days where you don't want to keep going and where you just want to hang it all up. Um, and it's imperative that we don't do that. 
It's also important that as people who engage in this work with young people, we are able to engage in hip hop practices ourselves. Because if we're asking students to do something, we have to be able to show them and model that for them and show them that we have interest and investment in the cultures that they come from. So in 2009, I started rapping in my dorm room in Queens College. Um, and at that period of time, I would get home from class and I'd put a beat on and I would start writing songs that were sort of detailing specific emotional experiences in my life. And through learning to tell my story, I learned to speak more vividly to certain aspects of my life that I had spent a lot of time trying to keep hidden. And this is because maybe I felt judged uh, or I felt that I'd be judged about them or I felt embarrassed about my feelings or I felt guilty about certain things I had done and I didn't want to tell people about them. But for some reason that I didn't really know at that time, all of those feelings went away when I was writing hip hop tracks about them. And so I'd go through this process of writing, recording, and then performing and sharing my songs with friends. And surprisingly, I received validation instantly, time and time again. And this was not only validation for my entrance into hip hop culture as an MC, but for the feelings themselves. And so you see, the differences that I had that I was so afraid to share were actually the very things that allowed me to connect to other people in a deeper way than I ever had before. And at this point, I had no idea that hip hop was functioning as a therapeutic process for myself. I was just rapping and I was just meeting people and I was just having fun. And when I got to Columbia University in 2011 to start my master's program in psychological counseling, I serendipitously linked up with my mentor and one of my great friends, Dr. Christopher Emden. And through conversations with him, we started exploring the inherent connections between what clinicians labeled as healthy therapeutic processes and what I had gone through and what many individuals go through in their processes of becoming an MC or of becoming hip hop or exploring their hip hopness. And I started sculpting out a model in the form of a term paper for a class uh, in the theories of counseling that I subsequently published in the Journal of Poetry Therapy. And now currently, I'm pushing this model within public schools as a tool for self-discovery and emotional development, particularly for young people in urban environments. And I can confidently say that hip hop at its core is therapy. So why do I feel like this work is so necessary, particularly for young people within urban schools? Well, in the spirit of this being the seventh annual Health Disparities Conference, and with us adopting a social justice and health equity title, I'm suggesting that our largest current health crisis is a lack of safe spaces that are available within public schools for students to explore their emotional experiences and develop healthy self-concepts. Here's some facts to back that up. Youth from minority racial ethnic groups are approximately one third to one half as likely to receive mental health care as white youth. And in the event that these individuals even do receive care, disparities not only exist in their initial access to care, but also in service quality and service completion. So the experiences that young people are facing outside of schools go unresolved and then ultimately manifest themselves inside of classrooms to the detriment of academic outcomes. So it is very safe for us to say that the outside of school tensions that individuals face have a direct impact on the achievement gap. So if youth who traditionally underperform in schools are also the ones who do not seek therapy, aren't offered therapy, or are offered inadequate therapy, and they come from communities where mental health stressors are most prevalent, it becomes imperative that we develop a model for teaching and for counseling that utilizes culturally responsive approaches to addressing the mental health needs of urban youth. So what is going on in schools and why aren't schools handling this issue? Well, that's a big question, but I have two thoughts. The first of which is that there's a general lack of value placed on counseling services with inside urban schools. And that, in my opinion, stems from the large amount of focus that is placed on academic outcomes. So schools are often funded by the statistics that they are able to produce, and those statistics usually follow academic outcomes. And the longer you are in class four, the more likely you are to succeed. And so if you are pulling students from class, even if it is to discuss difficult emotional experiences that they're facing that prevent them from performing inside of that classroom, they're like, no, 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 don't do that. Hold on, they gotta stay in class. 
right? So what I'm saying is if we deal with those feelings first and then those young people enter those spaces with healthier mindsets, then they will ultimately be able to learn and succeed the statistics that we are producing right now. So the second biggest problem, I would say, and it's tied into that first, is that the work that we often do, very much like what Dr. Emden said moments ago, is divorced from youth culture. We are not bringing youth culture into the classroom. And what this does on a daily basis is it makes young people feel as if they are not valued and feel as if they are not respected in those spaces. And without establishing that sense of comfort and that sense of belonging, then these young people are never going to cultivate the willingness that is necessary for them to explore their emotional experiences. Now there's a bevy of research to support the conclusion that a healthy therapeutic relationship is a powerful, is in fact the most powerful indicator of success within therapy, within a session. And so if we are telling young people on a daily basis, explicitly and implicitly, that we do not value them, we are not developing deep emotional relationships with them, and we are hindering their emotional success within that space. But this creation of value and youth culture can occur from the inclusion of hip-hop practices within schools. The reality, though, is that schools are not using hip-hop. And therefore, they're not valuing youth culture or young people. So in order to assist in this process of becoming more self-aware and assist young people in this process, we need to put considerable effort into understanding where our young people come from and the experiences that they face on a daily basis. Now, research suggests that young men of color are generally opposed to the idea of seeking therapy or seeking uh, opportunities to sort through their emotional experiences. And more often than not, this is a direct result of gender norms or gender role stereotypes, right? So in order to be outside and be able to maintain this image of being a man or being strong or being able to overcome the everyday struggles that we have let manifest inside these communities, it is necessary to avoid feelings of weakness or vulnerability especially necessary to never be perceived as weak or vulnerable by the people around you. And so therefore, in order to survive, there's a cultivation of inexpression. This development of this hard outer shell that allows one to persevere, but more often than not leads to long-term emotional deficits because there's a bulk of emotions that are not being addressed, that we in fact work so hard to hide. And it's almost as if the harder, stronger, and ultimately more masculine you are able to appear, the more credibility you have culturally. So now, imagine you're a young person who is outside with that guard up, working so hard to hide who you are, and every day you're walking into a school that tells you who you have worked so hard to be in order to survive is often not the person that you are allowed to bring into that space. And so you walk into that school every day and you hear things like, take that hat off, or don't wear those shoes, or don't talk like that, or my personal favorite, hold up actually, before you can walk in here, I need you to walk through that metal detector real quick. We are telling young people on a daily basis that we find them to be a threat, and if they don't learn who, how to drop who they are outside, then they will never find success inside, and this is just plain out not the case for young people from suburban environments where there is little to no distinction between the lies we lead outside and the lies we lead inside. I am a testament to that, and that's not fair. And we see hip hop culture as something that is less than what one should be in order to succeed in our country, and the lack of value that we place on hip hop within these spaces creates a platform that is incredibly difficult for educators to then work with these young people to break down those barriers and delve deeper into their own thoughts and feelings. So by stripping young people of their culture within those spaces, we will prevent them from finding success and we will create tensions into who they feel and think it is okay for them to be in order to find success in this world. We are allowing this health disparity to persist, if not worsening it. But hip hop is a practice that is socially acceptable and counters this narrative. So we can use this tool for school health as a platform to help young people use their own culture to explore and express their emotional experiences. So as a practice that is both rooted in evidence-based theories and aimed to exist within schools and harnesses youth culture, we seek to make sure that young people feel valued, 
that they feel comfortable within those spaces, and that they are able to break down these shields that they have worked so hard to create in order to protect their emotions. Because if the development of these hard outer shells establishes cultural credibility, then it becomes imperative, and I need you guys to hear this, it becomes imperative that we develop mental health interventions that maintain that cultural credibility and social acceptability while simultaneously allowing them to sort through and discuss those emotional experiences. We can't say, don't be hip hop, but find out who you are. We have to say, you can be hip hop, and that can make you successful, and that can make you self-aware. So what does this look like in practice? I'm talking a lot about hip hop. What does it look like? Well, in hip-hop, we aim to help students self-actualize or self-actualization, right? So in order to discover their genuine selves amongst the bulk of stressors that they face on a general day-to-day uh, -day basis. But now for self-actualization to occur, a combination of both problem identification and emotional exploration needs to occur. Hip-hop and spoken word therapy combines various evidence-based practices, such as cognitive behavioral therapy, person-centered therapy, music therapy, bibliotherapy, and poetry therapy. Now, Jones 2005 states that music and text on their own have been effective platforms for helping clients disclose emotions. However, there's also research to support the conclusion that when music and text are combined, emotional openness is increasingly likely in hip hop, for those of you who don't know, is a combination of music and text. So we suggest that by creating spaces for young people to now write text over music or over instru instrumental beats might in fact be quite effective in helping them release and discuss their emotional experiences. Drawing from person-centered therapy originated and theorized by Carl Rogers, hip-hop therapists believe that young people have all the tools they need themselves to address the struggles that lie within. Our role is simply to be there to evoke them. So as Lauren Hill, one of the baddest and best MCs we've ever had, said, how you gonna win if you ain't right within, there's this general understanding that the things that we need to deal with are within ourselves and we are the ones that can deal with those. And that is why the main construct of hip hop therapy is lyric writing. Now when you go to write a song in hip hop, the first thing that you need to do, and all my MCs know this for some of them who are in the room, and I know there are a handful, you have to be able to identify a concept. And if you can produce a track that sticks to that general concept, then your listeners are most likely to be like, yo, I dig that, please let me hear that again, run that back, I wanna hear more. In hip hop, we use this idea of a concept as a platform for therapeutic dialogue. So in either an individual or a group setting, the counselor will help students identify an emotional theme or a concept that is rooted in an emotional theme we will then facilitate a discussion around said emotional theme to address all of the thoughts and the feelings that we have in regards to it, how whatever this theme is manifests in our lives, and then we work to convert that conversation into a song. And so lyric writing gives us a direct glimpse into the mindsets of the young people that we are working with. But evocation cannot occur without the creation of a safe space. And the use of a safe space, or the establishment of a safe space within hip hop therapy is done through one of the main constructs of hip hop, which is the cipher. And a cipher, for those who are unaware, is a group of individuals standing on a street corner sharing rhymes back and forth, and there's one individual within that group who holds that whole process down, and that's the beatboxer, right? And so if I'm in a cipher and I'm beatboxing and there's one guy who's kind of struggling to get his rhymes out, and maybe he's fumbling with his rhythms a little bit, I might support him with maybe a little bit more of a extravagant beat, right? To help support that space and get everybody moving and support that individual. Now, if that individual is on top of it and they're doing what they need to do, I'm just laying back with a simple boom bap beat and letting him go to town and do what he does. Now, I would say that that process is synonymous with group counseling, right? In group counseling, a bunch of individuals come together to sit in a room, there's an emotional theme that they are all there to discuss together, and there is one individual who is known as the group facilitator, whose job is to weave in and out in order for them to stay on point and make sure that they are discussing that emotional theme. So if there's tension within that group counseling session, or if there's some silences and the group doesn't know where to go, or if there's that one person who monopolizes on that space, or if they drift off topic too much, the facilitator throws in a couple 
you know, a couple restatements or summarizations here and there, just to ensure that that conversation is reinvigorated and focused on what it needs to be. And that, to me, is just a hip-hop cipher. Within counseling sessions, one of the main things that we focus on time and time again to create that safe space is the establishment of norms, right? Everybody in this group needs to know what the rules are. We need to, we need to really make sure that we create a list and that people are on the same page. The beauty of the cipher is that it comes with pre-established norms that every single young person that is within that space understands and can carry out without command. So within the cipher, everyone has equal chance to share. All voices have equal value. There's a wording of praise when individuals want to share, and there's a support of others when they need it. And so I have an example. Um, one of my students sitting out in the audience, Nick, the other day we had a new student come um, to the session for his first time, right? And he was a little nervous, and he put together some rhymes, and he was looking at his phone where he had his rhymes written, and he didn't really want to share, and he was like kind of nervous about it, right? So I thought, all right, I need to say something. I need to help this kid become you know, more confident in this moment and help him share. And this was like all went through my head in like five seconds. And before I could get up to say anything, Nick stood up. And he said, yo, man, look, when I started, like I put together rhymes that weren't even good at all, but it didn't matter. Like just try something, dude, just try it. Right? All alone by himself. I said nothing. And so right after he said that to him, he's saying, yeah, in the audience, because he knows it's true. <laughs> it is, it, it, right after he said that, right, that student was like, OK, I'm going to share. Right? Put that beat on. And he shared out his lyrics. And then following suit, every individual within that group showed that individual validation, right? They told him how dope he was, and now he plans to come back for the next session we have, right? And so the cipher sets a stage for people to feel as if they belong. It counters this usual narrative for young people within schools where we have to walk around emotionally distraught with nowhere to go to talk about the things that we are going through. And the beauty is that the cipher does this by itself. I didn't do anything in that moment to make that happen. All I did was open up my office and say, yes, this cipher can exist here. And now this validation that this individual and that everybody within a cipher receives, all it does is encourages you to go home, go write more, and then bring back whatever it is that you wrote because you want to share it out. And this process that we go through in writing these songs is, is emotionally charged, right? It creates this hunger to delve deeper into self because the more emotional themes that we are able to pinpoint, the more tracks we're able to write, the more validation we're able to receive, and then the more we're able to shine within the cipher. So we can start helping these young people move from this place of inexpression to this urge to express. And the space that is created by the cipher increases validation, strengthens support between group members, and establishes that safe space that is necessary to evoke emotions. And evocation as a whole, be it through lyric writing or the creation of a cipher, ultimately sets us up as clinicians for the use of cognitive behavioral therapy interventions to address those feelings that have been evoked. So you cannot merely just bring out emotions from an individual. You have to be prepared to address those and give them tools to address those feelings, right? One of the staples of counseling is never break someone down if you cannot build them back up. And so hip-hop therapy draws three main interventions from cognitive behavioral therapy. That's problem identification, cognitive restructuring, the use of journaling, and role play. So as a hip-hop artist, I'm that person that students look to when they write something and they're, they, they want an opinion on it, right? So my students come and they say, hey, Mr. Levy, come check this out. Look at these lyrics. What do you think of this? And as I take this page and I start reviewing their lyrics, this is when problem identification occurs. So my goal as I'm scanning these lyrics that this student has created is to ensure that the lyrics that they produce accurately represent how they feel. So I scan their verses, and I'm looking for lines that are maybe hard to understand or might represent a certain cognitive distortion, such as catastrophizing, which is where one draws maybe much worse of a conclusion than may be warranted for a specific situation. Right? And the counselor can then follow up based on these lyrics with statements like, hey, what do you mean by that line? I don't, I don't really understand that. Can you explain that to me? In order to then engage in a dialogue with that student around that line. And that allows us to clarify if they indeed were on point, and if they weren't, then we can talk about, wow, OK, I don't think what you're saying really matches that line. How can we rework that? Right? And in addition to this, if we notice maybe some cognitive distortions, we might say, 
hey, you know, I see in this line you wrote that you're sad, but based on the content and the rest of your verse, it kind of seems like you're really angry. Maybe we can rework that to more re uh, accurately represent that. And it's this type of analysis or reflection or follow-up questions that we have to ask students to ensure that they're able to pinpoint areas where they may be mislabeling how they feel. And we help clients clearly name that and then rework their verses to represent that. Then, of course, they spit that back to the group. They begin to own those feelings and learn how to more critically analyze um, the way that they feel. And on the surface, all we're doing is helping the students make sure that they're writing verses that are better. But in reality, we're helping them self-actualize because we are letting them identify their feelings, evoke their feelings, and then helping them speak more vividly to their emotional experiences. Because as I said before, that self-actualization process requires both problem identification and expression. The next tactic that we utilize within cognitive behavioral therapy is the use of journaling. And these function as homework assignments. So in short, my students all have notebooks. They're writing in notebooks constantly. And they are assigned with the task of, during the week, I just want you to reflect on all the things that you're going through and bring that notebook back to me for our next session. And so this journaling that these students do is seen as a lifestyle modification. And so every single day, they are working to consciously convert their thoughts and their feelings to rhyme. So if they're at home and their parents are arguing, they can lock themselves in their room and they can write some rhymes about that moment. They can put a beat on and get that all off their chest. If they're on the train and they're just feeling reflective, they can put their headphones in, put a beat on, and start writing about it. Because they know that now when they get back to a session with me, they're going to be, and their group members, they're going to be able to share out those feelings. And then we're going to be able to have a discussion around them. Right? And then so maybe the fellow students in the group are really going to dig the concept they came up with, and that's going to turn into an entire track. Now everybody in the group is going to say, yo, that, I agree with you, man. I'm going to write a verse about that. And then we can create an entire track about that emotional theme. The idea is that the work that they're doing during the week is then used as the basis for those counseling sessions, but that also on their own they just have this new tool to analyze their experiences outside of school. And the last tactic that we utilize within cognitive behavioral therapy is the use of role play. And role play in, in, in hip hop and spoken word therapy utilizes this idea of collaboration, right? So it's a bunch of individuals jumping on a track together writing about the same theme, right? So let's say that I have a student who is struggling with his relationship and he comes and he says, hey, I have these issues with you know, within my relationship and I really don't know what to do about them and he tries to get some rhymes down about it. I might ask him, okay, why don't you, you talk about your struggles to the group and why don't we get the rest of this group to all write rhymes talking about struggles they've faced within their relationships. And now after they're all done, we can all engage in a conversation about why we wrote our verses. And now that individual who had brought a struggle of his own to the session is able to engage in a conversation with the rest of the individuals in that group and is afforded like five or six different perspectives on the same emotional struggle that he was facing, allowing him to be like, yeah, actually, I like what Al-Haji wrote in that verse because that's kind of dope and that kind of reflects maybe a different way that I could have gone about talking to my girlfriend and maybe we wouldn't have had that whole fight, right? Or something like that. But the idea is that the verses that other individuals create acts as advice, right? And we are playing out certain situations it becomes a form of role play. Before I get to my students, because I really want to show my students off to you guys because they're amazing, I have some pictures of what my space looks like, right? Because we're saying that we're creating hip hop spaces within schools, right? So it's great to be like, yes, let's rap. I'm going to put a beat on. But it's even better when students walk into a space and they turn and they see something that they never see within an academic space before. And so uh, an, a follow up piece that, uh, that Dr. Emden and I are actually working on is the use of that recording studio within academic spaces, right? And what that looks like and how that can be a beacon of hope for young people, right? And so this right here is theory and practice. Those two chairs right there, we might sit right there and lay some paper down on the desk and have an emotional discussion about a track that they wrote. We might go create a beat to match the theme of whatever it is that they've created and then they'll hop in the booth in the corner and we'll lay down a whole track, right? And so we are in the studio, but what we're really doing is we're in the middle of a therapeutic session where we are digesting all the things that we've gone through in that day or in the weeks prior, and we are having discussions around it. This is what a group session looks like, right? So all these individuals are in sort of different little subgroups in the room writing songs about different emotional themes. And then after they're done, we're going to share out. So there's a beat on in the back, and they're all writing. And this is traditionally what it looks like, right? And so you see kids in all different spaces, right? You see these kids in the back corner over here. Um, 
looking at, looking at a little book of rhymes sitting on a bean bag. There's kids on a couch over here. There's some people around the table. This is not what a traditional academic space looks like, but all of them are focused on exactly what they need to be doing. And it's because they want to be doing what they're doing. And so I'm going to share one last story with you to intro my students. Uh, the other day, I had a student come over to me. Um, it was a few weeks back. It was in the weeks after the um, after Eric Garner's uh, murderer was not indicted. And I was in the lunchroom in my school. And I ran into one of my students, Kelvin, and he said, Mr. Levy, I've been writing about what's happening. Um, I want to maybe bring this to group later. And I was like, yes, please, let's bring this to group later. So then we all got together. And he presented his idea, hey, I think we should write a track about what's going on right now. And so the whole group agreed and actually wanted to add other individuals who have also um, been in media as of late, right? So it went from just Eric Garner to Eric Garner, Mike Brown, uh, Trayvon Martin, and Jordan Davis. And I put all those names into uh, a hat and I shook that hat up and then they all took a piece of paper out and whoever's case they got, they were tasked with going and reading an article on that individual and then using what they have researched and what they know about it and how they feel about it to write a verse about that case. And so each of these individuals was able to put together um, a song that we then performed for our school. It was just a fantastic experience, right? So what we're doing is we're helping these young people, right, come from a place of inexpression where maybe they're facing something that they really don't know how to talk about, so they just put up this wall and they don't talk about it. So then moving into spaces where it's okay to talk about those amongst their peers, to then recording a song about it and sharing it with their friends, to then performing it in front of an entire student body, to now being here at Columbia University, about to get up on a stage in front of all of y'all and share with you what they have worked so hard to write. So if I could just... Um, bring up Jason Alcikias, Kelvin Hernandez, Ahaji Berry, and Raj Singh. That would be amazing. Um, and one of you guys has that folder with your, with your slide notes in it. I made, them, I made them write some of their thoughts down. It's a, it's a purple folder. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, bring that up. <laughs> so these are uh, individuals from the uh, AMS2 Charter High School in the South Bronx and the Jane Addams campus, if any of y'all know where that is. Um, and they're just working so hard, and I'm so happy to have them here for you guys. All right, Ahaji, I don't know where you put those things, so we got to go off the top. <laughs> okay. So they're going to break down their, their, some of the lyrics from their songs for you guys. So, in one of my lines that I wrote in this track, I said, if I was following a brother selling cigs, I wouldn't kill him, I would think about his wife and kids. Now, the meaning behind that is, all right, so... In that line, I put myself behind a cop and thought even if I was going to arrest somebody for whatever they did, I would never kill someone. I would think about their family and how their side of the family would affect their life if somebody in their family had died. So, yeah. The line? Yeah. The line, yeah. All right. If I was father and a brother selling cigs, I wouldn't kill him. I would think about his wife and kids. The line I chose with Mike Brown has surrendered, but his head took two. And I picked this line because it shows the injustice of a system that's in place currently where an 18-year-old kid can get shot at 17 times after surrendering without being given a chance to prove his innocence or taking a trial or anything of that sort. Mike Brown has surrendered, but his head took two. Uh, hey, my name is Al Haji. My verse is about the trial and tribulation of Jordan Davis, who was m murdered on November 23rd, 2012 by Michael Dunn. I felt like I had to write from Jordan's perspective due to the circumstances he was murdered in, since I feel very strongly about hip-hop and hip-hop therapy. It was kind of insulting when Michael Dunn referred to hip-hop as rap crap or thug music, and that's what led me to my first lyric in my verse. 
turned the music back up. Blood spilled in the cup due to a white man not being able to call for back up. Um, my name is Raj, and my verse, I pick out a line, and it's a Zimmerman's out there. He's a free convict. You know what's wrong with that, all of that and beyond it. So um, I wrote about Trayvon Martin's case, and I think that the ruling that Zimmerman was not guilty, I thought it was unfair because it was, I, I just thought it was unbelievable. And um, not only in Trayvon Martin's case where the killer was not convicted, but also in the Amadou Diallo case, they did not convict him. So everything and beyond. So this is their track titled 5 Gotta Know. Yo, yo, getting choked, you didn't hear me say I can't breathe Better put your hands up when the police say freeze before they squeeze When I'm dead, they didn't hear my wife say that she wants your head Man, either way, if I didn't get choked, you probably shoot me with the lead From up above, see my kid crying on the bed If I was five and a brother selling six, I would've killed him I would think about his wife and kids You didn't do that, you said who that? Oh crap, you're too black Talk for hours, I was till chill, yeah, you do that I don't understand how you could kill a man Say sorry to his family, yeah, you you the one who did it. Sorry for your loss, your police man quit it. July 17, that's, that's the day of my death. I love his times I said I was running out of breath. So you left me on the floor. You forgetting that we're equal Government gotta stop this Before it turn to a sequel Have everyone thinking that the white men are evil I really hope the smashes get to the people Yo. Everyone repent for your sins People getting killed cause they color of their skin Everyone repent for your sins People getting killed cause they color of their skin 17 shots to an innocent kid Look at what this innocent cop did had his hands up, which means don't shoot. Mike Brown has surrendered, but his head took two. Cops was really power, yeah, it ain't nothing new. Ferguson rise and put the cops in the tomb. But the cops got military weapons given by the government, like some kind of present. How you use lethal force on your own people, then get mad when they turn and try to beat you. You a white man, but I'm sure that you bleed too, no matter your skin color. Yeah, we all equal. Look at Martin Luther King, yeah, he had a dream. He left us with a message, and this isn't what it means. But white people only say this isn't how it seems. We all know how the law bends in their hands. They kill a black man and don't expect us to be mad. But the truth is that the table return the black man wouldn't be able to return home so I'ma end this by saying rest in peace Mike Brown and, and to anybody that was shot down. down welcome to America the nation that we live in we're calling on Muslim terrorists is what we teach our children where all blacks are guilty and racism just keeps on building but the whites don't get punished for the sins they've committed we all know racism's a lie just admit it everyone we're praying for your sins people getting killed because the color of their skin Everyone repent for your sins People getting killed cause they color of their skin hey. Turn the music back up Blood spilled in a cup due to a white man not being able to call for back up So we turned this track up for the sake of a boy who was supposed to be strapped up in the SUV truck this is the basis, justice for Mike Brown, Trayvon, and Jordan Davis Murdered by old races and prolonged cases and trials Or the wild death by just piled by cops with a smile in the single file Don't forget Eric Garner, R.I.P. He'll be missed by strangers in his own partner But all these stories in the twine Like water and wine, a bean stalk with a vine Or a lemon or a lime I said twist and you'll find the meaning you can't define This is life, not mine The next time I can stop this other a shotgun I'll be carrying none Hey yo, you remember the story of young Trayvon? His family misses him every day that he is gone. What if I walked around drinking Arizonas? You'd be ready to arrest me like I drink Coronas. Can I raise a hoodie up your inskillers for fun? Nah, damn, but you would think, think I got it done. Now I'm never gonna see my girl again. Got shot, point blank, oh well, what then? No justice for little trade from the prosecution. Prosecution is that worse prostitution. prostitution? Zimmerman's out there. He's a free convict. You know what's wrong, that all, all of it and beyond it. it. White supremacists always wanna win the race. Might take us out with the swing of a mace. I thought segregation ended. That's a spit in the face. History repeats. I see what my grandma faced. Trey's dead body. His hands. Do you see these candy and juice? He gon' kill you with diabetes. My dad kids, if I come home or not a lot. Trey was his only son, the only one he got. 
How could you do a little man such slime? You didn't arrest me who committed the crime. He only 17, just stopped being breastfed. Recipe straight by Martin. Now he's dead. R.I.P. Thank y'all so much. I will take questions after. Thank y'all, thank y'all. Look at that. We have Thank you. we have one more quick song to perform um, before we take some questions, if that fits within the time. Oh, wonderful! So we got time. Perfect. Um, can I bring those other two students up and? So this next track um, is another example of how students have engaged in this practice. Um, and it, it covers a different theme that is still very real. Um, it doesn't follow this social justice theme, but it does um, follow a lot of the struggles that they face on a daily basis. And so the conversation that preceded the creation of this track was um, we just had a discussion about what kind of stressors we were stuck on in a given day, right? We, we were sitting in a session together, and it was like, what, what are we going through right now? What, what is really... Um, hard for us right now. And what it, got, what it got down to was that all of us were sort of reminiscing on relationships that we had and some stressors within those relationships. And those relationships were different for each individual, so we just stuck to reminiscing about relationships. We had a discussion about that, and then they created this song that I will let them break down for you and then perform. Kelvin here again. <laughs> the line that I chose is, I don't focus on the past, I just focus on now. And I chose this line because I believe people are too busy reminiscing on the past and they don't pay attention to what's happening at the time being. And because of that, they can miss out on plenty of opportunities. Um, <clears throat> my name is Nick, um, the one Mr. Lee was talking about. Um, the line I chose was, mama, mama told me, boy, you always stay humble. Because in life, I know everybody goes through struggles and we all need somebody to pick us up. So my mom was always there for me to pick me up. <laughs> okay. My name is Christian, and my line was, I want another chance, so I'm writing this song. Basically, as what Mr. Levy was talking about, about how men expressing their feelings towards hip-hop, I express someone like very special to me like well, I, I, as a girlfriend, and I feel like, I, like I, everybody makes mistakes, everybody's not perfect in relationships, but eventually, like, if I, can, if I can't get my emotions um, expressed to her might as well express it in hip hop to let her know how I really feel and hoping that right. proving her that everyone is different in their own ways alright um, one line I picked was when going wrong how you make it go right a simple answer you just do what you like so <laughs> so this song was for one of my best friends and my ex when both left my life, I found myself in a dark place. So I called my brother one day, and he just gave me advice, and he told me, bro, you do what you want, be around people who really want the best for you and love you, and you'll be good. Relationships is something I reminisce about. Thoughts in my head, thinking if I'm missing out. Not a day goes by that I don't have a doubt. But I don't focus on the past, I just focus on now. I don't act her, I act like a funny clown. Come a gonna get me next time she come around. That's okay, I'ma just keep doing me. But sometimes this isn't who I wanna be. I wanna be somebody that you truly need. I'ma keep it a hundred, just, just like Will. Will. Changing it into a guy that tells like you how it feels. feels. Listen, I'ma always try to keep it real. No matter what happens, just know that I'ma be here. That I'ma be here. That I'ma be here. I'm 
think about how I did the wrong, how I it changed my life. life. And every day I think about it, it just gives me tight. So I want to change my life and do the right thing. So all these loose strings, I want to make them in the tight strings. In life, I've been through a lot of struggles. My mama, mama told me, boy, always stay humble. And stay up out of trouble and stay up out these streets. I said, mama, I got, I got you. you. I ain't never going to leave. Watch who I be. I'm going to be something, something great. What I need is some love and a little bit of faith. It's always something real, but thinking about it could be fake. Thinking about it could be fake. Chris G's. <laughs> thinking about it could be fake. Wait. Let's get it. I should have known it was you. Back from the start, you trying to move on, but I was always in your heart. Burning all the pictures, deleting all our combos. Ignoring all my phone calls, you telling me I got what? Time went by and I realized what's going. I want another chance, so I'm writing this song. This one's for you, cause I know you was the one. With your nice, perfect smile and your perfect little bun. I know you was hurt, but you got right back up. I want to say sorry, but I messed that up. You understand my struggle, and yeah, I really trust you. I put you through a lot, but girl, you know I love you. Girl, you know I love you. Girl, girl you know I love you. Girl, you know I love you. Girl, you know I love you. Think about my years, reminiscing on the past. Ain't gonna lie, the kid I was bad, ain't gonna brag. But now I'm all damn colder. I be my real homies, I just bring closer. We heat up like a toaster in the summer, spinning in between our sights. We just living life. And Brian pulling up, he ain't giving advice. He asks, I'm going wrong, how you make it go right? A simple answer, you just do what you like. Kids in my view, you're my dude, man, you living so nice. It's so appealing, sending high the price. I'm more below than you go, you keep living your life. For what I've seen, man, you living in Right, but more spite. Regardless of the bull, you still my bros, bros even after the fight. And looking back, that, that was a funny ass night. night. But never worried when I make it, I'ma pass you the mic. Then I can see you really do what you like. Man, am I wrong or am I right? My brothers really help me with the problems that I have with my girl. Damn. Or should I say my ex? I read the reason why she does not form with disrespect. That's why I never answered and I leave you on that check now. When you text back, I never check the text. She wonder why I'm the biggest, biggest threat, you the biggest effect. Wonder if I cleaned up well, I'm still a mess. Wish I never met you, so I never had the stress. But why child would you wish? Cause there's really no regrets. She has said when it comes to rap that I am the best. And get used to my queen, you so better than the rest. Your freaking beautiful face, you take away my breath. But now I'm more than proud, y'all may see me as the press. This is life, and everything happens for a reason. That's why the closest people kept on changing, like the season. For example, while my ex when I kept on leaving, man, she made me a better man. And yes, she know me for who I really am. So believes in this dream, thinks I really can. So thank you, baby girl, you're my one and only fam. So thank you guys so much. Um, I want to use the remaining 11 minutes for some questions because I think that would be perfect. So if there's anybody that has any thoughts, um, please share them or, or ask some questions. Yes. Ahaji. Ahaji. Come hand this. Oh, no, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Ian, thank you so oh, much. Thank you. As a former superintendent, I just need to tell you that you should be cloned and put in every school district in New York State. Thank you. What has been your approach to um, superintendents? As I train superintendents and principals now, what approach do you have to let us like cookie cutter this and mm -hmm. put it uh, for a presentation before superintendents or principals in your school district? Because they need to hear this. I'm so proud of these young guys because these could be my grandchildren. And, you know, when I was in the school district, I, the teacher would say, don't send them to drum because she's just going to hug them. I don't do discipline. Mm -hmm. I'm either going to be too hard or too soft. And when students came to me, I always wondered what sent them to me. And my approach was not to deal with them, but to deal with their parents. So you can't, you know, deal with that in New York City, uh, New York State, uh, 
with all the unions and all of that kind of stuff to go directly to the students as you have done. Um, how do you, what is your approach? Because this, they need exposure to, as you guys would say, older people, well, into two or three generations beyond you, but we're cool. I mean, I, when you guys came in, you'll, you, I see kids, and I, when you came in and you will all verify, I didn't know you, I said, good morning, did I not? Just coming in. So, because I know that you guys, be, be, be underneath it all, you need me, but I need you more. Well, thank you for your support. It's awesome, um, and it means so much. We, um, in order for this to, to be something that exists in more places, um, we need to ensure that the individuals who are running these programs really and truly understand the young people that they're working with, right? So um, while I would love to say, let's expand right now, let's, you know, let's make this huge, let's put it everywhere, um, I, I, I'm hesitant to cookie cut or anything that is hip hop because I don't want to diminish the complexities of hip hop, right? And so um, I, I would say that and I'm not saying you're saying that we're going to diminish the complexities of hip hop at all. Um, I'm just saying that in order for this to happen, we have what is now um, an amazing opportunity, which is the certificate program at Columbia University, where we will be training people to do this work, and we will be ensuring, under direct supervision of people that are um, that are trained to do this work and who are doing this work, and in schools, um, you know, uh, to to really make sure that the individuals that, that we then send out to all these schools all over the place are applying this work um, in a way that we can guarantee is going to be successful with young people. And so we absolutely intend on spreading this program, but first we uh, intend on training them rigorously um, through the brand new certificate program um, that Dr. Uh, Emden and Dr. Wallace are putting together here at Columbia Teachers College that I'm super stoked to be a part of. Um, Greetings, family. Just, so, oh, it's your turn. Your turn. Go I'm ahead. I'm sorry. No, you go, please. <laughs> um, first of all, as a senior citizen, <laughs> although I may not look like one, but I am from the 50s and the 60s, and we had rap and word back then, but it was done with a different rhythm and with a different beat. I have to be honest with you. Uh, I taught dance education in public schools for 25 plus years and the art of, of dance is very very um, important in allowing individuals to express themselves not just for themselves but realizing that they will always have some kind of audience and that they have to find a way to communicate what they feel inside physically without any words so the fact that you're using words in addition to physicalness um, I know that it's moving in through and around you, but most importantly, you've gotten in touch with your spirit. You see, we don't talk about spirit in our school system, and that's the biggest problem I have experienced in my 25 years. However, the spirit in you has touched all of us. Why? Because we're all spirit. There's spirit in each and every one of us and around us and in that wood that you're standing on, on the platform. So um, when you ask the question, superintendent that's teaching, um, the fear in our school system is allowing the spirit to be released in every individual. That's the fear. It's not the young people. It's not the old people. It's not all the legalities. It's not Common Core and all this other stuff that they're putting. They want to deny the spirit, the human spirit, to come out of us. And then they know we cannot be controlled once that spirit has the power and authority that was given to us the day we were born and even before then. So anyway, getting back to cookie cutter. Okay. I don't want cookie cutter. I saw what happened when they tried to take small school settings that were successful and expand them, okay? So um, cookie cutter is not the answer, but being trained rigorously and having people with the knowledge and skill and the compassion and the passion that you have. Just one last thing. I want to know, one of you, can you just say how this experience has in, how has it affected your lives in some way? Um, me, I think that is kind of like um, a good way to express myself, to express 
you know, how I'm feeling, things outside my control. And yeah, it's, it's just great for expression. All right, like what Rod said, I feel like it's also a part of expression because, like, you can't go in the school and, like, be who you are. You have to be what they tell you to be. You have to follow their rules and their obligations. So when we're with Mr. Levy, it's, like, kind of just like a free session where we could just come and merge all of our ideas together and be one. I just, I just wanted to thank you guys um, for bringing it, bringing it real. And what I love about it is the way that you talk the theory, you give us the framework, but you practice what you preach. And you bring uh, real life classroom examples of how you're doing this work. Very powerful. Thank you, man. Um, and acknowledging the power and potential of emceeing as an art form mm -hmm. uh, to be liberating practice, you know, a practice of freedom, but also acknowledging the courage that it takes uh, to take that risk because it's, it's a very vulnerable you know state to talk about things that are very personal and close to you and you were able to do that with us uh, in the cipher today so I just wanted to thank you for taking the risk and for being vulnerable as I was listening to uh, the presentation I kept on thinking about the power of the art of emceeing but also the scope of hip hop as a culture, mm -hmm. the multimodalities that hip hop embraces, yep. thinking about the core four elements, you know, and thinking about DJing, thinking about um, graffiti art, thinking about breaking, you know, as dance, and thinking about <clears throat> how I could see this exact same model being applied through all of those Every core element. four elements and beyond when we look at krs one you know in the nine elements of hip-hop we talk about fashion we talk about street entrepreneurship the creative ingenuity that comes from from hip-hop mm -hmm. and i think that those are you know the sky is the limit in terms of the ways in which we mobilize hip-hop as culture to talk back to speak back and to take back as a as a as an artistic response to to oppression so i just want to thank 100%. you for the work that yep. you're doing yep from its birth it's been exactly that and the intent is to um engage in every element in a therapeutic way um and that is just something that we are definitely going to do and as an mc i currently just am engaging in that lyric writing process with young people because that's where i am trained and that's my that's my stake or that's my um that's who i am in hip-hop um, but that's not to say that if we did not train um, other individuals to apply it via their given element um, that we could not create that in other ways. So thank you, man. I agree completely. And I think we're just out of time. So thank you guys again. Oh, oh we have one more question. Yes. Uh, okay. So one of my two questions. Um, when we think about trauma, we also have to think about loss and disenfranchised grief. And, all we, and when we're engaging in these types of spaces, we don't ever want to witness it, right? So we don't ever want to trigger. So with that being said, do you ever find that the work is triggering and so how do you process how do you debrief mm -hmm. with the youth actors? absolutely um there's the power of the um one-on-one -on -one relationships that i have with students as well and so like i showcased a lot of the the group counseling model um today so that that, that what they do together but uh individually i have relationships with a lot of those individuals so in the event that anybody is triggered or felt away like that would that would lead to sort of when the group ends, me and that individual having that one-on-one -on -one session um, to work through those feelings. Or if the group is, it happens to be very ready in that moment, right, um, to work with them, then we can do it amongst the group. But there's sort of, if that's not the case, um, then I, there's always that individual relationship as well. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Let's, let's give Ian Levy a big hand.